one of the curators at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts in Montgomery. And I'm here to talk today with Casey Norman, our educator, about some objects that are in our collection. And we hope we're going to be able to tell you a little bit about those objects and the artists who made them. Can you tell us what self-taught art is? Self-taught art is a lot of different things. And the terminology with regard to self-taught, folk art, um, visionary art, outsider art, um, it, anonymous artists, there are lots of different ways to refer to artists who did not receive traditional art training. That started as far back as there were artists. There were artists who were self-taught. They basically taught themselves. It's very descriptive, which is why, and because it is so descriptive and very generic, uh, people use it a lot because the other ways of referring to some of the artists that we think of as self-taught are more defining in their character. So using the word self-taught um, can describe a number of different kinds of things. But to get a little more specific about it, we have a couple of paintings in our collection by an artist named Erastus Salisbury Field. And they are examples of what we would call traditional American folk art. Uh, we also have a painting by an artist named Edward Higgs that is another example of traditional American folk art. And while those artists were self-taught, they weren't totally self-taught, but they didn't receive the kind of training that allowed them to make highly refined and um, representational imagery that would classify them as a fine artist, especially not in the 19th century. So, they were basically the, the people that we think of as folk artists. Uh, and it, that, that term is used to describe paintings and furniture and uh, textiles and lots of different things that were made, most, most of them in the late 18th and 19th centuries in the United States, a lot earlier in Europe. When we get to the, the 20th century though, we start to change what we mean by that. Folk art, the term folk art, usually refers to something that is made by someone who is following uh, a tradition of how you make that art. Uh, frequently, for example, the best example is a young girl who learns to quilt from members of her family, her mother, sisters, aunts. They all get together and they all quilt. The artists that we have uh, here in Alabama who are the quilt makers of G's Bend, they're a wonderful example of what we think of as folk artists in the sense that they served apprenticeships within their family to learn how to do quilting. And their style derives from their families in that community. It's very distinctive. When we so they they are self-taught in the sense that they are making individual works of art within their own way of making them and their own aesthetic for what they found uh, beautiful and, and appropriate to do for themselves. Uh, but we also, and so for that reason, we refer to them as self-taught, but they, they are a different tradition. A lot of the most important self-taught artists that we have in the collection from Alabama truly are what we think of as artists who came into making art without any formal art training at all. The first one that we have, and the, the most um, prominent these days uh, in, in terms of reputation outside of Alabama, is an artist named Bill Trailer, who worked uh, in Montgomery, uh, actually sat on a street corner downtown, uh, drawing on bits of cardboard that he found. And he used materials that were given to him by an artist here in Montgomery named Charles Shannon, who was very interested in what he was doing because uh, Mr. Shannon wasn't trying to teach him to make art. 
He was just providing him with materials to do what he was already doing with just plain old number two pencils. So the drawings that we see by Bell Trailer in the collection were collected by Mr. Shannon because he basically really enjoyed what the man was making and he felt like it was a really important statement about this man's life. Mr. Trailer was um, not able to read or write and he had been actually born as a slave on a plantation in West Alabama and he had come to Montgomery rather late in life. So the pictures that he was drawing were a lot of them images from his life in the past and apparently he would tell stories to Mr. Shannon and to other people that were around him, that is Mr. Trailer, when he was there on the street corner. A lot of the drawings were almost illustrations or stories that he would tell. So Mr. Shannon looked at this and said, gee, you know, this is really this man's wonderful biography. It's not written uh, and we can't say the spoken word like we might in other situations, but these drawings are his life, what happened to him, what he sees, what he knows. So it was important to Mr. Shannon to save them for that reason. And also because he, he truly, I believe, liked Bill a lot. And he recognized the worth of these things as not just drawings, as art, but as an artifact that, that was about Bill Trailer himself. We're really lucky to have these in our collection because uh, there weren't, while he made a number of them, uh, he only made them for a very few years. And so the ones that came into our museum's collection came directly from Mr. Shannon, uh, and they were the, some of the first ones that came into museum collection at all. And now his works are in uh, New York museums at the Metropolitan and the Museum of Modern Art and, and very important institutions around the United States and in Europe own his drawings. So it, it's really wonderful for us to have these, especially in Mr. Trailer's hometown and in his state, for sure. The second artist that we have a collection of and <clears throat> who would be considered self-taught is also someone from Montgomery, and that's Mose Tolliver. Uh, Mose was a, a man who trained, uh, grew up in Pike Road or out in South Montgomery County, uh, and was also largely illiterate, not educated, but had, had worked in Montgomery for uh, a furniture uh, store, basically, but he worked within the warehouse. And there was an accident uh, in the warehouse, and a pallet of very heavy material fell on him, and he was largely crippled by that. His legs were not able to really support his weight very efficiently anymore. So when he was recovering from this accident, the man who owned the store uh, came to see him, and he saw Mose apparently doodling or, or drawing or doing something, making some images on some paper. And he, he expressed an interest and said, you know, why don't you try painting? Because uh, I think maybe this man actually himself was sort of an amateur painter. And so most took up the habit of gathering materials that people would donate to him, just bring him. And, and he was using donated house paint uh, to make images on plywood. And he made a lot of them. But all of them were simply things that came out of his imagination. Um, unlike Trailer, he didn't really go into his history at all to, for, for subjects. He was more interested in contemporary world, contemporary life, but also nature. He did a lot of pictures of flowers, birds, fruits, um, people, lots of people, uh, people he may have known or people he imagined, made up. He also was exposed to some contemporary news um, and he, he did some images of current events. We have a bust uh, in our collection that may or may not refer to the bus boycott, but he was familiar with the civil rights movement, what had happened in that. So essentially he was using his own life experiences to promote his work uh, and, and to, to give him the subject matter that he wanted in order to 
be able to make his work. So he was truly a person that we would refer to as self-taught, as was Mr. Trailer. Then you get into later artists who were also making work here in Alabama, and among the most prominent of those are members of the Dial family who lived and worked up in Birmingham, Alabama. Thornton Dial was uh, a laborer. Um, he was somewhat educated, uh, worked for the Pullman Car Company, which is a, a, a company that made train cars for many years. But at some point, he simply decided to start collecting materials that we call, we call them found objects, but in reality, they're things that other people threw away and junk. And he collected that, things that nobody else wanted. And he began to assemble them to make things uh, for his own edification. He didn't make them to sell to anybody, show anybody. Basically, when he started, he just started making things for himself. And he, he had a, a group around him. He had a brother uh, and some cousins who, who were sort of also engaged in this kind of practice of putting together found objects into things that engaged them using subject matter that they made up themselves. And his work over time, Thornton Dial Sr.'s work over time, became a lot more complicated because he actually did begin to interact with uh, people outside of his family, outside of his community, within the art world. And, and the art world began to respond to what he was doing. The person who was most closely connected with him was a man named William Arnett, who lived in Atlanta, who was originally from Alabama. But he began to collect work by these self-taught artists in Alabama and to save it, uh, and eventually collected enough that he built a very large collection of this work that has over time began begun to leave, it left his collection, he passed away very recently, left his collection, went to a foundation, and it also has begun to be disseminated to museums around the country through a foundation he put together called Souls from Deep. So, to go back to your original question, what is self-taught? All those things are self-taught. What was the motivation for these people making these works? It was very practical in some instances. Women made quilts because their family was cold and they needed to, to have something to keep them warm. Um, Mr. Trailer, while we don't know, he never actually told us that this was his biography. Functionally, it was his biography. Uh, Tolliver, he began making these works for himself, but very quickly, people in Montgomery started discovering what he was doing, and they, over many years, would flock to his door. They would bring him materials, and he would trade, at first he would trade works of art for material. Later he began selling them, but people began to really interact with him, and that interaction, as much as anything else, may have been what engaged with him and made him think, I want to keep doing this. And he did keep doing it for most of his life. And his family started doing it. It, it became sort of a, a family affair there for a while. With people like the Dials, and especially Thornton Dial Sr., the motivation was probably more philosophical. He began to see how people were reacting, and he actually began to want to interact with the people who were reacting to his art. So he started doing imagery that had socio-political content to it. Uh, and he communicated that through the art and through Mr. Arnett and through other ways, other interviews, things that he did. So his art began to approach much more what we think of as the way a contemporary artist, trained or untrained, approaches their art in that desire to really connect with their audience. Wonderful. Um, so somebody that might not be a museum goer or really familiar with the arts, they come into a museum and are expecting to see works like Sargent, yes. and they see works like Charlie Lucas or Rose Tolliver. As a curator, how do you 
how do you say, you know, self-taught artists and folk arts and, of all forms belong in a museum collection? Well, there's a lot of reasons that I would say they absolutely belong in a museum collection. The first reason that I would say they belong in our museum collection is because a lot of this work is extremely relevant to Alabama and the history of art in Alabama. Most of the art made in Alabama uh, from the time of its settlement to really till today, most of that art was made by untrained artists. They didn't know that they were untrained. Um, they didn't realize they were artists in some instances. So that lives, that goes to, does someone walk into a museum only thinking to encounter things that artists thought were art? Well, maybe, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it, it's a little limiting because at this point we understand that a lot of what was being made by people like Trailer and Tolliver and Dial reflects the, the society in which they lived too. It reflects the people who lived here. If we see a painting by, and a very beautiful painting by John Singer Sargent, to the best of my knowledge he never visited Alabama. He never visited the South. His world was the, the cities of, of the East Coast uh, in, in the United States, and even more specifically, the, the cities and the cultures of Europe. And while we study those things, and, and those give us perspective on where we are as a people, and who we are, and what we do, and what our art is now, uh, that tradition of Western culture, What's more important from my perspective is that we appreciate that and we understand it. But for people who live here in Alabama, it's equally important that we understand where our art comes from, what was important about it, both to the people who made it and those who saw it in the period in which it was made. So for someone in Montgomery to walk into the art museum and see a Mose Tolliver, in my opinion, that should be just as significant as seeing that John Singer Sargent, because one has to do with the big picture, and the other has to do with our local picture, and our local picture does matter. Um, and you can walk into the Metropolitan Museum today and walk back to a gallery and see a work by Thornton Dial from Birmingham, Alabama, hanging on that, those walls for everybody from all over the world who comes to the Metropolitan Museum to see and come and interact with and hopefully appreciate. So I would say uh, for someone to come to the museum in Montgomery, I hope they'll take and make an especial effort to look for the work that, that is what is the product of Alabama because I think that's really important. Another artist that we might want to talk about in terms of the artists who are in Alabama who are considered self-taught or people who didn't go to art school and really came to art through some compulsion that they had that they just wanted to make something and they didn't necessarily approach it as art. They, in many cases, like Jimmy Lee, they were just out kind of uh, playing around with making images and not necessarily thinking of saving them. It's almost like doodling for Jimmy Lee. Jimmy Lee uh, used to go out when he was a teenager, a young, uh, you know, a, getting up a, more than a child, but probably less than a teenager. Jimmy Lee would go out in the uh, forest and he would draw images that interested in him in dirt or sand or some kind of um, swampy area. And of course, he never thought that these things would be preserved because they wouldn't, they were out in nature. It's almost as if you go to the seashore and you take a stick and you draw something in the sand. You know the water's gonna come wash it away, right? Well, for, for whatever reason, he, he decided he really wanted to save some of these things. So he got to the point where he started trying to figure out, how could I do this and actually make them last? do them in such a way I could keep them. And so he began to experiment with using what he was drawing in, that is the dirt, to actually make the drawing. And he would put it on something like a piece of plywood or some surface 
And of course he eventually realized, and he was working a lot of times with clay because clay is very sticky. And when it dries, it can be, it can harden and it has texture and it's, you know, it makes a form and a shape that if you did it as a drawing, you know, potentially you could keep that. Well, of course he also understood eventually that when it dries, it becomes very brittle and fragile and it would simply crumble and it would become dust. So he had to figure out a way to make it stay where he put it. So at some point he hit on the idea of adding sugar to the clay. And he, he would refer to that as sweet mud. He would call it sweet mud. And in doing that process, and we don't know exactly what he used. Some people think he used Coca-Cola. Some people think thought he used just some other sort of sugar water. But it, it's not really clear exactly. And he may have changed what he used over time. We're not really sure of that either. But he would make these drawings and he started to understand that they would actually, when they hardened, they were semi-permanent. Of course, if they were jostled or knocked around, whatever, um, they would eventually start to degrade. But over time, he really mastered the whole sweet mud medium. And of all the people that you can think of as artists over history, I've never really encountered anybody else that made paintings with mud other than Jimmy Lee. And so he's, he's very unusual in that respect. And he also learned how to convey a, a kind of a sense of mood with his paintings just by using that mud. Um, his earliest works, a lot of them, uh, and we have several in the collection, are only mud that he used. And he found different colors of mud and he would make images with the different colors of mud. There was yellow mud, there was brown mud, there was red mud, gray mud. He, he really could make a beautiful composition just with mud. But after he had kind of mastered that process, he also then began to incorporate commercial paint too, because he realized he could make it more vibrant and he could you know, create a more elaborate composition. So a picture like the portrait that we have of the lady. You can see that bright, bright red lipstick is bright red. It's not mud, it's, it's a paint. And in the painting of the woman milking a cow, the blue and the yellow are obviously brilliant, beautiful colors, and they're not mud, they are actually paint. But in general, he minimized the use of the paint as much as he could to use m natural materials. He expanded in some places you'll see that he used black that looks almost like charcoal uh, and some of it might be charcoal but the other way that he would get the look of, of, of black soot was he would be he would fire up his lawnmower and he would hold the panel up to the exhaust of the lawnmower and that that burning carbon would get deposited on the panel and then he would shape that to be whatever shape he wanted. So he was, he was one of those people who was just ingenious and he, he, he challenged himself in many ways to figure out how to make the images that he wanted. And that is the sign of a true and really creative artist, I think, when they have to work it out for themselves and they aren't given necessarily the advantages of the training that another artist might have, but they still do things that are just amazing and um, really express what it is they're trying to say with their art.